Okay, so for part three, we're flipping toward talking about Rome. And particularly not all of Roman society, but really about the role of slavery in Rome. The concept of it, slavery being called a social death, what they mean by that is that while slavery is in its old position, but it increases dramatically as these early civilizations and social classes form and develop into the second world civilization. Slaves in these times in the classical era are often described as having had any social death, meaning that they typically have no rights and are considered to be permanent outsiders of that society. They're kind of the large class of silent people. It's hard to generalize slavery in classical society because throughout the world and throughout human history, there's been all kinds of forms of slavery, making these generalizations difficult. But trends we find with the classical era are that slaves are not typically hereditary. Um, it's either through a form of like indentured servitude for payment or prisoner of war scenario. It's more of a set time frame. Rarely is somebody a slave for life. It's usually for a period of time to either work off a debt or you know make payment as a prisoner of war. All right. The rate of slavery is much higher in the Mediterranean than in India or China when it comes to the classical era. Slave ownership was pretty widespread in Greece. Um, tens of thousands of slaves lived in Athens, which is supposed to be that cradle of democracy and individual liberty. But you have to keep in mind that democracy and that individual liberty only apply to Athenian males who were property owners and involved in government. So a very small percentage of the population actually benefited from that Greek democracy. Rome is also going to see a huge scale of slave ownership. The Italian peninsula itself had a slave population of roughly 35%. Slaves were often concentrated, though, in the hands of a few, meaning this is not a situation where every person has a slave. This is more of a situation where a wealthy landowner would own hundreds of slaves himself, but then the peasants down the street wouldn't have any. Since the slaves in Rome are coming from the borderlands of an ever-expanding empire, there's no real single group of people that gets enslaved. It's a very multi-ethnic group. You see Northern Europeans, Africans, Slavs, uh, people of Jewish descent, uh, Egyptian descent, they can all be caught up in the Roman slave system. So there's no like stereotypical look for a Roman slave. With so much cheap labor coming into Rome because of its you know, continuing expanding empire, slaves can be found in every sector of the economy. Seeing them from manual labor out in the fields to white collar work in the city, even the famous gladiatorial blood sports in the Colosseum throughout. Okay, this is an image I wanted you guys to look at because I want you to pick up on some of the nuances here. You can see in the caption that this is a slave serving his owner, somebody of a different class. You've got the slave who's called Nero, who's physically very fit, wearing very little clothing, turning to the right hand of his uh, master. One of the things you need to do to understand with the way it's described, he's leaning towards his master, he's looking at him. And even though he appears taller and stronger, the owner seems to have control of the situation. So what this tells us about Roman society? Well, this tells us that slavery is so ingrained that even somebody who is physically so much better fit and should physically be able to overpower the other doesn't. Why doesn't the slave overpower the master? Because the, the society and owner has so much power over their slave. The authority involved in that. Okay, regardless of, of the society and how slavery comes to be, Slavery resistance is going to be common throughout history. Weapons of the weak are often the ones used to resist slavery in the Roman Empire. You're not going to see these bloody revolution, rebellion kind of thing. What you're going to see more often than not for slave resistance is going to be work slowdown, sabotage, you know, all of a sudden all the shovels get broken. I'm sorry, we can't use those today. Or that idiot, you see uh, record records where some Roman slave owner talks about how dumb and stupid his slaves are because they keep breaking the wagon. Well, they're not dumb and stupid. They're making sure the wagon doesn't work so they don't have to work that day. They're actually pretty intelligent. Runaways are going to be part of the system. Um, and in fact, just like the antebellum South, there's going to be an industry in just catching slaves, people running around catching slaves. The most famous of uh, slave le rebellious leaders is Spartacus. Spartacus started his rebellion in uh, the year 73 before current era. Um, he leads a rebellion of slaves trained for the gladiator games. So these are often militarily trained slaves. So they're not, you know, 
not the five-year-old kid picking up pickaxes. These are gentlemen who are strong and at the peak of their physical fitness, holding swords and things. Um, Spartacus leads a two-year rampage of revenge up and down the Italian peninsula, freeing slaves, burning estates to the ground, killing masters. He does get stopped. Once he does get stopped, the Roman Republic is going to crucify some 6,000 captured rebels along the Apian Way as a warning to future rebels. Apian Way is the dash line, but then you can also see Spartacus's up and down, how he just basically wreaked havoc on the Roman Peninsula. Okay, the last piece of the mark is going to be kind of comparison, and how does each society's patriarchal role affect the roles of women, and how that differentiates between the classical and civilization. Um, in China, the traditional Chinese concept of yin and yang are going to stress all things that were material and lowly or um, unproductive were considered yin or female. The higher spiritual and moral forces of the world were considered male or yin. And you need both, but some are more important than others. So this unity of opposites helps to rationalize and codify the distinctions between men and women's roles and power levels within society. Confucianism is going to reinforce that, what we call the three obediences. A woman is taught from a very early age to obey their father. When they leave their father's home, they're to obey their husband. And if widowed, they're to obey their eldest son. At no point is a woman to be independent. Yet women from throughout the various social ranks are going to find small ways to exert some form of independent agency. Now, obviously the peasant women are going to be able to find more day-by-day -day freedom than the elite because peasant women are needed to go out and work in the fields with their husbands and you know the back baker and labor who's back baking labor it doesn't matter if you're male or female so they have a little more um, trouble living up to this Confucian ideal but elite wives can influence their husbands um, if she's a concubine she can influence her lover and in those ways women can kind of play a piece in palace politics mothers do have some power within the home due to respect for age. And wives are going to hold more esteem than a concubine would as far as value. So there are kind of layers within layers there. The one kind of big or great example of a huge exception to this rule in Chinese patriarchy is the story of Empress Wu. She's a concubine who is going to usurp the throne and govern China by herself for 15 years. She's unique in the fact that she actually serves as empress. There are going to be several female patriarchs who rule, like make the decisions and stuff for their son, but their son is technically the emperor. Empress Wu is by herself ruler in her own right. She does move to institute some reforms for more, for more gender equality, but they're not real effective or long term. After the 15 year end, reign for her end, this kind of experiment of a woman ruler is not repeated. Okay, a con contrasting kind of look, okay, Greece is going to be a little different than China, because even within Greece you have differing stories. Athenian women were very limited in their rights. Um, while the Athenians expanded the rights of male citizens and, and created the formation of a democratic system of participation, the elite Athenian women are subject to numerous legal and social restrictions. They're not allowed to own property, they're not allowed to run their own household, they're not even to be named or physically appear in public. It's home of these great thinkers like Socrates and Plato. Even though those education systems are there, and there's great thinking and sharing and all this stuff there, women are not to be educated. They're married off in their teens to men twice their age, and their whole role in life is to perpetuate and have more boys. One kind of exception to this rule is the story of Aspatia. She was born, born, and she becomes not the wife, but the life companion of Pericles. They never did marry. Um, they did, however, live together as husband and wife, and she was not confined to the home. Pericles is said to have treated her as an intellectual equal and asked her opinion on things and stuff, so she's kind of the rare exception in Athens. Sparta women are a little bit different. Sparta is really basically a mirror opposite of Athens in a lot of ways. Sparta's collective state system stressed military prowess in its citizens. So in order to gain physically fit and tough men, you have to have physically and tough fit and tough women to give birth. So women are encouraged to 
keep healthy and strong and participate in dancing and exercise and go on the hunt. Because they're out and active like that, their style of dress is more functional than, than and practical. So it tends to be very um, revealing and scandalous to a lot of other Greek women. Their main obligation, though, is to produce healthy children who become these strong warriors or produce strong warriors themselves. So marriage ages in Sparta are more equal. You tend to marry somebody your own age in Sparta, unlike the Athenians. You know, the wife is half the age of the, uh, the husband. This is the Athenian family of Athens. Hi, <laughs> I'm a playwright. And they're doing a wife swap with the Spartan family of Sparta. I'm a warrior. So how will these two very different Greek cultures get on? The fair sex is more just to uh, put you to think, but think back on um, the concept of Buddhism and how Siddhartha Gautama had taught that nothing is permanent, and the only constant in life is the concept that life changes. Um, we see this in this era of the classical era by the rise and the fall of these empires and these religions. But yet, there's also this concept of enduring patterns and lasting features. Even though every single one of those empires falls, a lot of the processes and ideas of this era are going to last and be revived over and over again in other forms in later centuries. Still today, we use you know, Roman law in the United States government, right? even 2,000 years later. Um, the concepts of Confucianism are still immersed in a lot of Eastern philosophy. So you see in these major world religions of Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism and Christianity are still large in Islam, are a huge part of daily life centuries later. 